Hi everyone, my name is Laura Stevens and this webinar is on how parents and caregivers can help children and teens with anxiety. We'll talk about strategies and daily practices you can put in place to promote emotional well-being and I will also provide resources and places to turn for support. This is part two of a series on anxiety and if you are interested in more general information about anxiety, please tune in to part one, Understanding Anxiety. There are a variety of strategies and daily practices to promote emotional well-being. These include taking care of ourselves, talking about emotions, modeling and co-regulation, calming strategies, getting comfortable with uncertainty, and what to do and what not to do in the moment. There are some daily things we can do to take care of ourselves and our children. The Canadian Pediatric Society recommends 9 to 12 hours of sleep for children 6 to 12 years old and 8 to 10 hours for adolescents 13 to 18. A consistent bedtime routine is also recommended and as we prepare to get back into a school routine, starting to transi transition from summer to fall schedules is important and best done gradually. For older children, there are specific guidelines around screen time, particularly before bed, and the impact of caffeine. In addition to predictable schedules and routines, a healthy diet is also helpful in maintaining not only our physical, but our mental health. Lastly, public health recommends at least one hour per day of moderate to vigorous exercise for children and youth at least three days a week. The next two slides are about talking about emotions, the first for young children and the next one for older children and teens. Try to make talking about emotions part of the vocabulary of your home. We know that anxiety is a necessary part of life some of the time. Letting your children know that it's okay and even adaptive to feel anxious at times is what we call normalizing. Let them know it's okay to feel nervous returning to school in September. It's okay to worry about wearing a mask more often than they're used to. And think about some of the sorts of things that you as a family can do to practice wearing a mask for longer periods of time. Or take a walk or a drive to the school to get familiar with the environment again. It's okay also to remind your children that these anxious feelings won't last forever and that part of the reason they're feeling that way now is all the uncertainty ahead of us. As the first day of school comes and goes, so will those worries for many kids. Remind your kids that their friends likely have some of the same worries as they do and that they will get through it. Generalizing means being able to use a strategy that you used in one situation in a different situation. So for example, if your child has been successful in going to the grocery store with you, although maybe initially they were a little bit concerned and didn't want to wear a mask, remind them that they were able to do it successfully and they got through it. We've talked sometimes about how emotions show themselves through behavior. If you can, try to separate them, sending the message that their feelings are real and validated while managing behaviors appropriately. There are some great books and games and movies that encourage healthy conversations about emotions. There are just a few examples here on the slide. As much as your teen wants to be independent, they also want to be understood and validated. When your teen tells you something that seems illogical, take a deep breath. This is your chance to put yourself in their shoes and show that you get it. Use statements that show your teen that you really heard what they were saying by using the same language that they used Try instead of giving advice, saying something like, it seems like you're really worried about getting sick. Your teen may be more likely to feel that you understand them if they know that you've experienced similar issues. Sharing your own challenges with insecurity and anxiety in, in high school, and even today, can open the door for communication. This is an also, also an opportunity for us as parents to really be aware of our own language. If we're stressing out, saying a lot of what ifs and using catastrophic language like no one will follow the rules, our kids might follow suit. Do your best to be open, honest and model resilience. The idea that although things might not go as planned, we can be flexible and get through it. Don't avoid questions about COVID-19. If you don't know the answers, try to find them together. It's okay not to know. Up-to-date information can be found on the Center for Disease Control website. Children or teens who are feeling anxious or suffering from anxiety disorders may repeatedly ask their parents or caregivers for words or gestures of reassurance. This may look like repeated questions to verify safety for themselves and others, checking or asking you to repeat facts of the situation for reassurance. While you may have an urge to provide such reassurance, and it may give you the impression that it's helping in the moment, Research has shown that excessive reassurance actually serves to reinforce and increase anxiety in the long term. 
Lastly, if you know your teen is anxious, make sure to check in regularly with them about their symptoms. Keep the conversation open. If they tell you something alarming, keep your cool. Your emotional reactions might scare your teen or make them feel judged. The most important thing you can do when you're concerned is comfort your teen, empathize, and let them know that you'll figure this out together. I'm going to talk about modeling and co-regulation together because when we're helping another person to regulate their behaviors or their emotions, emotions which is essentially co-regulating, we're also modeling strategies. To regulate feelings, we have to know what it is we're feeling. So accuracy is important. Label your own and your child's emotions and teach them to be able to identify and articulate how they're feeling. Validating feelings is most easily done by reflecting back to your child what you think they're feeling and if you know why they might be feeling that way. For example, I wonder if you're feeling sad because you weren't included when your friends got together. Using I wonder is often better received than I think or I feel like, especially with older children and teens. As much as you can, model what it looks like to regulate your emotions in the moment. Take a deep breath, take a break, or problem solve out loud. Wonder aloud what might help or what you might do next. Use positive and constructive language, but don't think that you need to paint the rosiest of pictures. It's critical that positive self-talk reflects reality and actual possible ideas and outcomes. Lastly, let your child know that mistakes are okay and an important part of learning. Practice makes progress. If you make mistakes too, that's okay. Acknowledge them. Let your kids know that you're doing the best with the information that you have. It's, all, it's okay not to know what's going to happen. Modeling this for kids goes a long way in building resilience. It's tempting to say to our children, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. But instead, try, this is hard. I understand that you're worried. Let's come up with a plan and we'll get through it together. These calming strategies are things that you can start practicing right now with your kids. It's much easier to use these strategies when you're anxious if you've already learned and practiced them during times of low stress. There are a number of mindfulness, deep breathing and relaxation apps and videos available, but here are some basic tips to get you started. On the next series of slides, I'm going to show you some examples of each of these calming strategies. In addition to these ideas, recognizing and reinforcing your children for coping well and using their strategies in stressful situations is very helpful. It's kind of like the whole catch them all being good concept. It reinforces for them that the approach they took was a good one and makes it more likely that they'll use it in the future. Deep breathing or belly breathing done properly is very effective. For younger children, you can encourage them pretend to pretend to blow up a balloon or blow bubbles into a milkshake, in through the nose, out through the mouth, with the belly rising up and down. Older children and teens have typically been taught this type of breathing at some point, and it can help to do it with them so they don't rush through it. Some kids like to trace their fingers while breathing, inhaling to the tip of your finger, pausing, and then exhaling down. Um, this is a strategy that you can take with you anywhere. Progressive relaxation involves tensing individual muscle groups, then releasing them, progressing through the body. Young children especially like to go through the motions, but aren't always actually achieving relaxation. When done properly, this type of relaxation practice is very impactful in bringing our minds and bodies into a calm state. It's helpful sometimes when first practicing pre progressive relaxation to point out when you notice your child is genuine re genuinely relaxed. Sometimes it's helpful to take a pit for parents to take a picture of their kids when they appear really relaxed so they can look at them together. What did your stomach, your arms, your legs, your face feel and look like? Another idea is to create a relaxation menu with your child. This can be done for kids of any age and like a restaurant menu has different sections such as relaxation activities that can be done alone, with others, at home or at school. Because the setting will impact the activities that are appropriate, this is a great activity to have kids think about how they can relax in different places with or without others. Some kids will come up with things like listening to music, which could fit into more than one section, while taking a warm bath is likely an at-home alone activity that can't be done elsewhere. For teens, they might identify going for a walk, napping, exercising, or cooking. The example on the left side of the slide shows something that you could use for smaller children, whereas uh, the relaxation menu on the right side might be more appropriate for older kids.
Because anxiety likes to speed into the future, grounding activities literally mean feeling the ground beneath our feet and being present in the moment. These activities really help bring our focus back to the here and now. And some, way to do, some ways to do this are through our senses. For example, thinking quietly about things that you can see, smell, touch, hear, and feel in the moment. Another way is to do some vigorous activity, even 25 jumping jacks, or to experience a change in temperature, like holding a cold or a warm cloth to your face. Further to grounding activities, practicing mindfulness is all about being in the present. Sometimes people talk about eating mindfully, paying attention and savoring every bite of something, or actively being mindful as you go about a task. Again, there are many apps and guided meditations for mindfulness online. Many children who are anxious demand certainty. Lynn Lyons is a psychotherapist who specializes in children with anxiety, and she suggests reveling in uncertainty. When we don't know the answers, we can't give that to them. Even when we do, being comfortable with uncertainty, the mites and the maybes, is an important step in managing anxiety. Rather than giving children a definitive answer, especially when we can't, it's more helpful to say, yes, that might happen, or we don't know, maybe, but we'll get through it and that's what's most important. Another strategy that she talks about is what I know and what I don't know. The idea is to make a list, what I know on one side of a piece of paper, then on the other side of the paper, what I don't know. As you learn things about the situation, draw an arrow or move things to the no side. For example, this can be done about the uncertainty about going back to school. Things that we know are that school starts on September 3rd. We know that if you were in grade four and up, you have to wear a mask. Things that we don't know yet are who are going to be in your class or who your child's teacher might be, but those things will become known in time. So what do we do when those big emotions surface? Because they still do sometimes. In the moment, the most effective thing that you can do as a parent is empathize, listen to your child and help them label their feelings to understand what's happening. Once you know how they're feeling and they know how they're feeling and maybe even why, then everyone is in a better place to move forward. Co-regulate with your child to help them over the bridge to that place of problem solving and logic. They will need you to model calming strat strategies and resilience that they can get through this and that you are there to help. Although it is tempting, do not teach new skills in crisis moments. Our brains just aren't in a place to absorb that learning. For example, a crisis isn't the time to introduce progressive muscle relaxation, but your child will be able to use that strategy if they've practiced it before and know it will help. School Mental Health Ontario has a wide variety of online resources for parents and families, educators and students. The site is easy to navigate and there are links that take you to step-by-step -step social emotional learning activities that you can do with your child. With illustrations and videos, they show examples of strategies like deep belly breathing, problem solving, and more. School Mental Health has also partnered with Jack.org and Kids Help Phone to provide a variety of online resources and videos for youth. Some general strategies they suggest for teens to maintain their mental health are do things you enjoy, not because you have to or think you should, but because these things genuinely make you feel happy. Take time for yourself. Being busy can be good, but being stressed all the time is not. Doing nothing is actually helpful in building your strength for the next challenge. Helping others feels good. When you take time to be kind to others or get involved in something bigger than yourself, it can give your own mental health a boost. Lastly, try to notice the good things. It's easy to get caught up in the negatives that happen in life. Try each day to find some positivity or something that you are grateful for. Tackling worries and anxiety on your own can be very difficult. Here's a list of other supports in our community that may be able to offer some support. There's also a lot of information online. Here I've listed a few trusted sites that have excellent resources for families. There are many excellent books and workbooks available for parents and families. I've included some examples here, such as the What to Do If series, Helping Your Anxious Child, the Anxiety Workbook for Teens, and some excellent books by Lynn Lyons. As we prepare to transition back to school, please know there's a team of people at your child's school who are able to support them. 
This will be unlike any return to school we have ever experienced and we will all be adjusting and learning together. Please don't hesitate to reach out to your child's classroom teacher or school administrator for support. They can help you and your child make connections to the most appropriate school-based or community mental health provider that best meets your child's needs. Thank you for taking the time today to listen. I wish you a very safe and healthy rest of the summer and return to school.